So, here we go. College Board SAT 2021 March. So right now we are into the year of 2021, right? We've been working um, on probably about like two years worth of College Board practice tests, the real tests that have been administered in the past. And so let's see how hard this 2021 exam was and let's really make some comparison and let's also really pay attention, as I always tell you, to see if there were any questions that were on this particular test that wasn't in any of the previous tests, right? Like, were there any new particular questions that you haven't seen before? Because let me tell you something. Some of the students that I've already I've talked to very recently all came up to me and they were like, Stephen, like in my last SAT, I feel like I saw a question that I haven't seen on any of these other practice tests that we've done together before. And I'm like, that's probably not gonna be the case, right? It's probably some variated version of it. It's probably some different wordings, perhaps, but I guarantee you it's not going to be any new concept they throw you out there, right? So just, you know, pay attention to see if you found any question that you thought, whoa, like that was new. Like I didn't, I, I, don't, I feel like I've never seen that before. Just see if you had something like that, right? So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in and let's start with section three. Here we go. Section three, number one, woo! This little function, I got all these A, B, C, D. That's got a negative 2 as a Y intercept. So starting from the bottom, D's cool, C's cool, and B's out, and A's out. And then it's got to have a negative slope. It is one-fourth, so it should be pretty flat. And between C and D, they are both negative slope, but D's a flat one, so there it is. Do you really have to count the... No, I don't f do that. It's drawn to scale. It's got the little... X and Y coordinates with the intervals of the scales of one each on the X axis and Y axis. So you don't have to really just like count the rise of a run. C is obviously a very steep line. So that's going to have a greater magnitude than a one fourth, right? All right. Number two, what is a positive solution? Yeah, subtract 10 on both sides. X squared is equal to 81. Square root both sides. X is equal to plus or minus nine. But it says a positive solution. So nine it is. And plus you don't see the negative nine in the answer choices. Number three, what value of x satisfies? Okay, distribute that shit. x plus 7 is equal to 3x minus now. Now, I would not have distributed had there been something that I can reduce. It just turns out that I can't reduce anything, which is why I'm distributing it. So go ahead and subtract x on both sides. Add 9 on both sides. Cancel the x's. Cancel the 9's. 2x is equal to 16. Divide by 2's on both sides, and there you have it. x is equal to 8. Boom. Number four. A line, slope of one. So get rid of nope. A, get rid of nope. B, because it's got to have a slope of one. And pass through the point zero two. That's the Y intercept, right? And there it is. Choice. What the f is this? Number five. From 1990 to 2001, German currency included coins called Phoenix, worth one Phoenix each, and Groschen worth 10 Phoenix each. Cut. Okay. So the P is just one Phoenix, and G is 10 Phoenix. Okay. Now, which, which equation represents the number of Phoenix coins, P, and Groschen coins, G, that have a combined of 85, so together 85, they all have 85, together. Well, once again, you know Phoenix got one Phoenix worth each, and then Groschen's got 10 Phoenix worth each, so it's got to be P plus 10G is equal to 85, answer choice B, easy. Number six. X is greater than zero, which of the following is equivalent to one over X plus one over two X. Just need a common denominator to go ahead and multiply this size by two over two. So that'll be two over two X plus one over two X equaling three over two X answer choice C. Now, this is super simple, but if you just completely black out for whatever reason it is, please just plug it in. It's going to work just fine, right? If you were to plug in x is equal to 2, then that will be 1 over 2 plus 1 over 4. I'm going to need a common denominator. Multiply this by 2 over 2. So basically doing the same shit anyway, right? And you get 2 over 4 plus 1 over 4, which gives you 3 over 4. So now put the 2s back into the answer choices, and which one gives you the 3 over 4? And only C does give you that one, right? So nothing else. All right, so that was an easier version, but sometimes we get a harder version. Don't matter. You just got to plug it in. Number seven, the graph in the XY plane is a circle. What are the coordinates of the center, right? So obviously I will do the whole problem because I'm supposed to be the instructor, but you guys are supposed to just stop if you got enough, right? 
So this is one of those questions that I tell you guys, you have to learn how to complete this course anyway for a specific questions like this, right? This one, you have to complete the squares yourself. So let's get it. So I'm gonna complete the squares for the X's separately and I'm gonna do the Y separately. So here we go. So the X's, that's gonna be X squared minus 10 X, mm, whatever. And so that's gonna be X minus five square and we should really be good with completing the squares by now, right? And then that one, that'll be y squared plus 6y. And then there's that mm. So that's going to be y plus 3 squared. And then if you do that, that's going to be a plus 9 here. And then that's going to be a plus 25 here when you foil that shit out. So that's what you must add over here on the other side as well. And when you do that, now, once again, you should not be doing this. Because if you do that, then you get, that'll be 27 and 9, so 36. So this is a, the circle with a center of 5 and negative 3. And it's got a radius of 6, right? So they're looking for the center, so 5 and negative 3, answer choice C. But once again, like I said, right, you should not have done the entire part. I'm only doing it because I'm supposed to teach you everything. But... Honestly, if you got this right here, the fact that you got a 5 over here, you should have gotten rid of A and B immediately. And then the Y coordinates, it's going to be a negative 3, which is why answer choice C is going to be correct. So you really shouldn't have done the right side where you find the radius. You should not have found the radius. It's, there's no point, right? The question doesn't ask for it. You should not have done it. All right, here we go. Number 8. When graphing the XY plane, what point XY is a solution? So here's the right way to do it. Right? So obviously we can't set them equal to each other because these, these are inequalities. And on top of that, not only are they inequalities, they do not have or equal to sign either. So it would really not make any sense for you to set them equal because none of them has equal sign. There's nothing equal about this. Right? So you should not have done that. So what you could have done is I'm going to graph these separately and then I'll show you how the graph is supposed to look like. Once again, you guys are not given different colors on the day of the test. So make sure when you do the colorings for these inequality graphs, you color it properly. I showed you how to do it properly, right? So let me, actually, you know what? Let me go ahead and not uh, use the colors either, right? So I'm going to grab this one first, which is going to be y is greater than 4x. So draw it like it's y is equal to 4x. So basically a linear equation with the y-intercept of 0 and then slope of 4, right? Well, I'm going to be super technical. It's going to be a dash line because ain't nobody got time for that. So that. I mean, you don't need to do it. I'll do it, but you do not need to draw a dashed line just because. No, you don't need to do that. But anyway, so something like this, right? Something like this. And then y is great. So how do we color it? You color using all these lines that are perpendicular to the line you just drew. What the fuck do I mean by that? Like this. This is how you want to color it, right? Does everybody remember that? Remember, you're not given all these different colors on the day of the test, so you want to color it like this. And then another line. So now I'm going to do this line. Y is less than negative X. So draw it like it's Y is equal to negative X. Y in a step of 0 and then slope of negative 1. So once again, dash line. Like I said, you don't need to care about the dash line too much. But anyway, this is the other line that we're going to have. And then since Y is less, we're going to color the bottom portion of the graph something like this. So does everybody see the solution region? You see why I color like that, right? Because that gives you a nice little checkers that clearly show where your, your solution should be at. So it is right here happening uh, in this portion of quadrant two and quadrant three. So if you had this picture, this question is a joke question because if you look and we're going to start from the bottom negative four and four that would be like right there and right there so probably sitting up top i don't know that's like iffy iffy three and negative three three and negative three that's right there that's hell nope. no that's absolutely fucking out and then negative two negative two that'll be negative two and negative two absolutely like that is most definitely and then one and one is right there absolutely nope. not so between b and d well b seems very clear that it should be long in that region that's why b is going to be the correct one so that's how you're supposed to do it right this is the right way to do it drawing that graph and then figuring out the solution region and then see which point belongs within that region is what you're supposed to do but f that, what if I don't for what if I don't just recall it and plus that took a long time right like you gotta graph all that shit and it takes quite a bit of a time. How do you actually do this on the day of the test? Plug it in. Don't do any of these shit, right? I mean, I only showed it to you guys because I'm supposed to be the instructor. But like, if I were taking this test myself, I would definitely not have done that. What would I do? I'll just start plugging in from the bottom and see which one works. Here we go. I'm going to try the D. 
And if you plug it into, let me just do it to this bottom one first. It really doesn't matter whichever one. If you do that, then that'll be y is 4 and x is negative 4. So if you do that, 4 is less than 4. That doesn't make any sense. 4 is not less than 4. Mm -mm, that's out. And you guys are going to see the point. 3 and negative 3, when you plug it in, x is 3, y is negative 3. So if you do that, then negative 3 is greater than negative 3. Mm -mm, that's not true either. So stop. And then negative 2, negative 2. Negative 2 and negative 2. So negative 2 is less than positive 2. That is absolutely true. Let me double check with the top one to see, make sure if it works for this one too. So negative 2 is greater than 4 times negative 2. So negative 2 is greater than negative 8. Absolutely true. There it is. It's got to be B. And if you plug in 1 and 1, it's not going to work um, because let me just show you once again. If you plug in 1 and 1 into the bottom one, it says um, 1's less than negative 1, which is absolutely false. So that's there it is. That's how I would have done this question um, instead of drawing that little graph, right? Like the graph, you know, the, the inequality graphs, you should know how to do it. And in fact, as I always tell you, you should know at least two different ways of doing the same problem. And therefore, you should really know the, the graphing inequalities part. But this is much faster. And I don't know if you guys all noticed, but check this out. A is positive and positive. Same signs, right? And C is negative and positive. D is positive and negative. And B is negative and negative. So from this, at this point, given that this, the, if you look at the second part of the inequality, the, the second inequality, it's got negative and positive. So I kind of already knew that it's probably not going to be these two C and D because they have the alternate, uh, like alternating positive and negative versus negative and positive. But if you just put it in right there, as long as they're the same values, well, it's, it's going to be the same value if you see what I'm trying to tell you, right? The negative is going to cancel with the negatives. Or if you put negatives and positive negatives, they're still going to be negative, negative. If this doesn't make sense to you, forget about it. But I'm just saying there was a little pattern uh, to which this question had a certain answer choice is given. If you didn't see that, it's fine. The whole point is you could have just simply plugged in and figure out, you know, what the right answer is supposed to be. You can simply just plug in. So anytime you guys are given inequalities, especially system of inequalities like this, just plug it in. Just plug it in. All right, number nine, the equation H is equal. To, okay, that's a linear equation. What is H? H is the housing units, whatever the hell that means. T months, and then so 10 is the slope. 150 is the y-intercept. So, okay, cool story. How many housing units are added to the community each month? How many are added each month? What the f*** does that tell you? The slope tells you that sh 10 it is, and there it is. Slope tells you how many are being added every time, right? That's what the slope is for. It tells you the increase or decrease. If you saw that, this question is a joke-ass question. All right, number 10. Which expression is equivalent to this? Okay, so let's go one at a time, right? 2x squared minus 5x squared. That should be negative 3x squared. Get rid of the A and B. And then between C and D, let me just look at the very last term. Negative 2 minus negative 7. So negative 2 minus negative 7. Negative 2 plus 7, and that should be a 5. Answer choice D. Enough is enough. Move on. Next, number 11. The graph in the xy plane equation above contains A and B, where A is between negative 1 and 1. So X is between negative 1 and 1. Which of the following is not a possible value of B, the Y, right? Okay, so if you got this question right, math props to you. You're definitely like... I would say top 10% of the fucking SAT populations. Like, you're really good. This question was actually really easy if you know what you're doing. But let's just say you didn't know what the fuck was going on. So what do we do? Plug it in, right? But then you can't really plug it in because, I mean, you could. But these are the Y values. You're trying to look for something that's not going to work for the Y. So what I did was this. You know X is going to be between negative 1 and 1. So the very simple number we can try is negative 1, right? So if you plug in negative 1 for all the Xs, then you're going to get a 0 over here in the middle term. So Y is going to be a 0. So Y can equal 0 is the point. So C will work. That's what you get rid of it. Does this make sense? That's how you are supposed to first attack it. And then let's try next. If you try plugging in 1 for the X, well, then you're going to get 0 on the first term, so that's still going to give you a 0, so that's not anything new. How about in between a negative 1 and 1? 0. Well, normally I don't like to plug it in, but for the sake of this question, I'm going to plug in 0 for the x, and let's see what we get. Negative 1, positive 1, positive 2, and if you multiply, that'll be negative 2. Oh, so this could also work, which means a is also out. So we're between b and d, so which one do I do? So we're between, the x has to be between negative 1 and 1. So I tried negative 1, 
I tried one, and then I got something. I got, I got, I tried zero, I got something. Now, then what do we try? How about negative half and positive half, right? So how about like negative one half? Where's this gonna take me? Well, you'll see. So if you plug in negative one half, that'll be negative three over two times positive one half, and that'll be uh, four over two plus negative one over two, so that'll be three over two. So if you multiply all this, shit, you get negative nine over eight, right? The point is, it is something negative. Now, check this out. In my, imagine I plug in positive one half, just positive, right? So if you plug in positive one half and see what you get, you're gonna get negative one half, positive three over two, positive five over two. When you multiply all that shit, you get negative 15 over eight. The point is, I hope you guys notice, they're both negatives. So between B and D, if I had to pick a choice, see whether I plug in a positive one half or negative one half for X, I keep getting all these negative values for the Y. So already from that, I should be able to make a great hypothesis saying something negative is probably going to be possible, but this positive, probably not. And that's probably what I'm, what I'm gonna circle. So this is not like super mathematical ways of doing it, but it's enough, right? Like you try all these different possible values for the X and you keep getting all these negatives, probably indicating that you can't get anything positive. So that's how you could have guessed it. Now, how do you actually think about this? This is how you are actually supposed to see it. First of all, you just have to figure out how the graph should look like. And I hope you guys understand this is a cubic function. What do we know? Quadratic function looks like this and cubic function looks like this, right? So this graph, how does it look like? Well, it's gonna have three zeros. X is equal to one, X is equal to negative one, X is equal to negative two. Those are gonna be the three zeros. So let's mark it, negative one, negative two, and positive one. So from this point on, well, I'm gonna mark all the zeros. The question is, does my cubic look like this? Or does my cubic look like this? this i don't really know right well can i figure it out absolutely well this is the whole like end behavior thing from your algebra too i'm a end behavior okay let's just figure out what should ha what should be happening at the very very right side or you could the very very left side but i don't like thinking about negative so let's just do the right side imagine x is like fucking 100 right imagine x is 100 then what do we get we get 99 times 101 times 102 whatever the fuck that is the point is is a huge number so if I go all the way to the right, the Y should be skyrocketing upward. Does this make sense to everybody? So then now you don't really know how the graph should look like you, but you know from one and beyond, it's gotta go like this, right? Because as you go all the way to the right, the X value is really big, the Y value is really big too. So given that, then you just gotta literally follow and make squiggles until you get something that looks like a cubic function. So I'm like, woo, 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 does that make sense? It's probably not the very exact accurate cubic function the way it's supposed to look like. Who the f cares how it's supposed to look like? The point is, I just want some trend. And check this out, peeps. What did they say? They said X is, so they said X is between negative one and one. So if you really pay attention to it, what are they talking about? Negative one's right there, positive one's right there. You're talking about right there, that region. Does everybody see it? And if you look at the loop, it is below the x-axis. What does that tell you about the y value? It's all negatives. The best you can ever do is zero, but it's going to be all negatives. So this positive just ain't going to work, right? The D positive one is not going to work. That's how you were supposed to see it. But once again, even if you didn't see that, you could have just tried plugging in all these different values for the X to see what kinds of values you keep getting. And you're gonna continue to realize that, hey, no matter what the f I plug in for X, I still get negatives only. So probably meaning these not gonna work then. It's a very well high, um, educated guess, right? So whichever way, but the idea of plugging in would still work. You just have to make some logical assumptions. All right, number 12, two beach balls are each uh, in the shape of a sphere. All right, uh, the larger beach ball has a diameter of 3x and the smaller beach ball's got a diameter of x. So I'm thinking radius, but the fact that diameter is triple probably means radius is also triple, right? Because, I mean, you know, if you want, you can just literally plug in like x is equal to 2. Then if the diameter is uh, 6 uh, versus 2, then the radius is 3 here and the radius is 1 here. So it's still triple, right? Whichever way. So now, given that, what is the ratio of the volume, volume of the larger beach ball to the volume of the smaller beach ball? So if you guys know the volume of the sphere, which is given in the front of the packet, it says 4 third pi r cubed. 
and then for a third pi cubed. So I'm going to do the small and the large, okay? If you think about it, this just is going to be 4 third pi r cubed as is, but the beach ball, the, the larger beach ball, that's going to be 4 third pi, not just r, it's going to be 3 r cubed. Does this make sense to everybody? So it's triple the radius, so you are cubing the 3 r, right? So if you look at it, it's everything the same, 4 third pi, and this is going to give you 27 r cubed. So if you pay attention to both, same 4 third, same pi, same r squared, I mean r cubed, the only difference you see is this new 27, probably indicating that your new volume for the larger beach ball is 27 times bigger, aka answer choice D should be the correct one. If you saw what the hell you were doing, this question literally should have been a one, oh, nah, not one second, fuck four seconds, five seconds question, because think about it, volume, volume is a three-dimensional concept, so you are going to grab the radius, and then you're going to cube it, because it's a three-dimensional concept, do you see what I'm trying to tell you, and if you think about it, triple, the radius being triple, and then that being cubed, you're thinking about times three being cubed, so that's why that's just going to give you 27 times of a bigger volume on the larger beach ball. If you're able to see the relationship between the variables and how they uh, have bring about an impact to the whole volume as a whole, aka, you know the radius is being cubed, but now your new radius is being tripled. So the tripled is getting cubed. So times three is getting cubed. It's time three, time three, time three. That's why that's gonna give you times 27. If you saw that concept in your head, this question should have been like literally five to six qu seconds question. All right, but if you didn't see that, if you didn't know it, like I said, with the way that I did it, you could have just simply plugged in x is equal to 2, then the x, that's going to be 3x, which is 6. So you can just figure out the, the formula. So the small one's going to be 4 third pi 1 cubed because the radius will be 1 on the small one. And then the big one is going to be 4 third pi 3 cubed because the radius is going to be 3. And then you can figure out the volume and compare the two. You could have done that if you would like. All right, number, 20, uh, number 13, what is the graph of the equation? That so we have the y-intercept at 2, so you can go ahead and get rid of b nope. and uh, uh, c, nope. right? And then between a and d, I don't know what you want to pick. What do we do? Plug it in, right? Remember what, what, remember what I tell you guys about these types of graphs all the time, right? Unless it's a linear or a uh, quadratic, you're not supposed to precisely know how to graph that certain function. You don't need to know that. Just grab a point and plug it in. I'm just going to assume that d is the correct one. And if I do that, then 1, 4 should be a valid point on that in that equation. So let me try plugging in, right? y is equal to 2, 3 to the x. So 4 is equal to 2 times 3 to the 1 power. So 4 is equal to 6. And that's f***ing hell no. So D is wrong then. If you do that, then A has got to be the answer. Is it really? Well, that's a 1 and 6 this time. Let's try plugging in. 6 is equal to 2 times 3 to the 1 power. 6 is equal to 6. Absolutely, there it is. A has got to be the right answer. So even if you didn't see the fact that 2 is the y-intercept and therefore you get rid of b and c, even if you didn't see that, you could have literally just plugged in x is equal to 1 and see which one gives you the right answer. Or c and a both would have given you the right answer, then just plug in another point, right? x is 0, x is negative 1, just try another point. All right, number 14, the graph, blah, blah, blah. Which of the following is the value for x? x, these are your x values, don't trip, for which f of x is 0, y is 0. So it's happening right there at negative 2. It is happening right there at 1. It is happening right there. God knows what the f*** that is. 2.2, .2. I don't f***ing know. So look at the answer choices. Do I see any negative 2s? Mm, nope. Do I see any 1? Mm, oh, there it is. C. There you go. All right. Number 15. The function that models blah, 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 blah. A of t is a number of whatever, t is a time, whatever, whatever, whatever. Which best? Which is the best interpretation of the 2 to the t over 6? So, people, first of all, the fact that you're multiplying by 2 already means what? It is doubling. Multiply 2, you are doubling this sh**. Look, start from the bottom. D, the number of the water increases by 2. No, 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 it doesn't increase by 2. C, the number increased by 2. No, no, it doesn't increase by 2. It's doubling right now. It's not going up by two. It is doubling. B, the, the number doubled every six days. Mm, okay, the number doubled. Okay, so they both got the double part. The question is, is it T times or every six days? Well, why do you think there's freaking T over six? Probably something to do with the six, right? So that's probably how you do it. Now, how do we double check this? Plug shit 
in, right? So if you just hypothetically say t is equal to 12, and once again, normally when I plug in some number for any type of variable that I see on the SAT, I plug in a very nice, small, even number, like a two or a four, but this time, particularly for the t, I'm going to plug in any numbers like six, 12, 18, 24, and so forth. Any number that is a multiple of six, because that's gonna be very easy to uh, keep track of, right? So if you want to assume that B is the correct answer, if it's doubling every six days, then in 12 days, it should it should have doubled twice. So if you put that shit back in, does it look like it should be doubling twice for T is equal to 12? Absolutely. That's why B is going to be the right answer. For questions like this, I highly, highly recommend for you to try that plugging in method because that's going to double, triple, confirm your answer and confirm your logic that you thought it the right way. All right, and then number seven, uh, 16, uh, the given equation, whatever, whatever, so it can be written in this form, so let's try to leave the T alone. Go ahead and add 8D on both sides, so 4T is equal to 8D plus 12H. Take out all the fours, then now you get T is equal to 2D plus 3H. What the fuck do they want? What is the value of A? A is the one that is in front of the D, and that's what this 2 is. Done. 2. All right. Number 17, figure above BC's per cool story, bro. Yeah, I can see that. AB is equal to CD. What is the perimeter of the quadrilateral? letter? It's a trapezoid, but obviously we don't like the shape trapezoid on the SAT. People, think about it. What's the most frequently popped up shape that we always see on the SAT? Triangles, circles, of which this one probably triangle. What kind of a triangle? Right in triangle because SAT is obsessed with right triangles, right? So I'm gonna cut it like this and cut it like this. And I want you to notice if that's a 10 and that whole thing is a 26, then over here and over here better be 16 in total, right? Because that portion is gonna be a 10. So 16, but you know these two triangles have to be the same because it's got the same angles and it's got the same sides. And, and you know, I mean, and it's got the same sides over here as well. So if you run down the Pythagorean theorem, the bottom has to be the same too. But regardless, it looks like it. It doesn't say figure now, drawn to scale. They look equal, fucking say they're equal. So now they got to split the 16 nice and evenly. So that'll be eight and eight over here. Does everybody notice? Six, eight, 10, three, four, five triangle, right? So over here, same thing, six, eight, 10 it is. So you want the perimeter 10 10 10 all this 26 add them all up and that's 56 right there 10 10 10 26 56 all right number 18 equation above has got a solution what is the value of n plus k so not factorable gotta either do the quadratic formula or complete the squares I'll do both, but as I keep telling you, completing the squares is gonna be much faster. Let me do quadratic first. Negative, negative two plus or minus square root of negative two squared minus four times one times negative one, all over two times one. So that'll be two plus or minus square root of four plus four all over two. That'll be two plus or minus square root of eight all over two, which is two plus or minus two radical two all over two. Cancel all the twos and that'll be one plus or minus radical two. So you know n's gotta be one, k's gotta be two. So one plus two, that's gonna be three. Wow. So that is a quadratic formula way of doing it. Now, I'm doing it fast because I'm supposed to be the instructor. I'm pretty sure for normal populations out there, it's gonna take much longer for the quadratic. Now, how do we complete the squares? Well, this is what I would do. Just add one on both sides. So that'll be x squared minus two x is equal to one. I'm gonna complete the squares as x minus one squared. So you just gotta add one. You gotta add one here as well. And when you do that, that's equal to two square root both sides. X minus one is equal to plus or minus radical two. And then finally add one on both sides. And there you have it. X is equal to one plus or minus radical two. Much faster, same answer still. So yeah, it's gonna be n is equal to one, k is equal to two. So when you add that, it's gonna be a three so yeah i mean whatever floats your boat but as i keep saying i'm pretty sure i'm objectively speaking at this point that completing squares is much easier and faster and more convenient perhaps but you know what if i were taking this act test on the actual day of the test i would probably run down both of those methods just to make sure i did it the right way like if i'm getting the same answer whether i take the uh completing the squares or quadratic formula i'm still getting the same answer yeah then i'm pretty double confirmed triple confirmed that i got my answer correct right so it's gonna relieve your mind right all right, here we go, number 19. X, Y is a solution, what is the value of X? You want the X, you wanna cancel the Y. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab the top and multiply by 17. Huh? Why the hell would you do that? Because then you get 28X plus 7Y is equal to 49. So get rid of that. And now when you add these two, you cancel the Ys and that gives you 30X is equal to 50. 
Cancel the zero, divide by three. So there you have it. X is equal to five over three. Boom. Easy. Number 20. In the given equation, K is constant. Cool story, bro. The equation has no solution. I don't want no solution. So I don't want that equation to make any sense. We've seen almost exactly verbatim questions like this from our last test, right? We've already done it before. What is the value of K? It's got to be one half. Why is that? Because then you're going to get one half X plus five is equal to one half X plus seven, which doesn't make any sense because if you subtract one half x on both sides then that's going to give you five is equal to seven which makes absolutely no sense that's what you want because you want no solution so that's why k is going to be one half ain't nothing else right you don't want this equation to make sense had k been anything else than one half you would get a solution whatever the, f the solution that may be you're going to get something as a solution k is equal to something but if you do k is equal to one half then you're going to get no solution because the equation will be invalid aka the very definition of no solution and that basically wraps up the entire section three of the 2021 march sat how do you guys feel now that we just looked at number 20, which is basically almost the verbatim, was it like question 18 or 19 from the previous test, the 2020 December Asia test? Like it's almost exactly the same question. So this is where I'm delivering that point once again, that every test is really not going to differ much, right? So whenever you'll be taking your actual SAT, I guarantee you it's not going to be any super different than all these packets that we've been working on. So that's why I keep telling you, mark your questions. Whatever the questions that you keep making dumb mistakes or you feel like you haven't perfectly mastered the concepts yet for, whatever the hell it is, keep marking the types of questions because very likely you will see them again and again and again being played on the actual day of the test. Just reword it, some variated versions of it, but the underlying concepts are going to be exactly identical.
So, section four. Let's see how hard this was. I believe I could have used my calculator for some of these questions. I don't think I did the whole test entirely without a calculator. I'm pretty sure I used it for like a few questions just because I got pretty lazy, but we'll see what those questions were. Here we go. No, section four, number one. A sample of whatever, 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 whatever. I don't want to reject. How many samples have a pH of 7.4 or greater? So anything that one to that one is cool. That's total of seven. Done. Next, number two. In 2015, the city of Miami 441,000 people, an area of 36 square miles. What was the population density in people per square mile? You just freaking punch that shit in. And this is where I feel like I probably use my calculator. And then when you do that, you get 12 to 50, which is answer choice B. All right. And then uh, number three. Metropolitan, whatever, whatever, whatever. How does the median diameter of the plates of the Roman Empire compare to the median to median to median? If you look at the Roman Empire, median's right there. Ancient Greece's median's right there. So Greece is obviously greater. So G is greater than R. There it is. Answer choice A. Easy. Number four. The combustion of glucose release. Who the f is? We're not in chemistry class or nothing. The ratio of grams of glucose combusted to kilo. Ain't nobody got time for that. Okay, I don't know what the f you're talking about but this is all the way i'm gonna be like glucose to energy i'll just write it like that so glucose to energy i mean everybody should know that you know the chemistry I me mean, learn that shit. who the f cares right don't care you do not need any outside knowledge on this test so glucose to energy is 12 to 45 can i reduce it yeah I'm, I, I, I won't do it i'll wait until you know later how many grams of glucose must be combusted to provide 85.5 kilocalories energy? So you want 85.5 this time. So what should this be? Easy. It's just proportions. Yeah, you can do, do that and then set them equal, cross multiply. You could do that. Or you can use the Stephen King method of, oh, yo, 45 to 85.5. That's like almost double, but not quite. It's not exactly double. So that should be almost double, but not quite. So it's got to be 24, a little bit less than that. And that's just f***ing C. You really shouldn't have to use a calculator for this, man. I mean, 45 to 85.5, that's like almost double. So talk to whatever, almost double. Yeah, 22.8 sounds almost double. All right, moving on, number five. The function f is divided by that sh What is the value of f of three? Yeah, just plug it in. f of three is equal to three squared minus seven. So nine minus seven, two it is, boom. Next, number six. The probability of an unfair coin landing head size up is 0.6. Okay, so it should really be like 0.5 and 0.5 heads or tails, but apparently this one, the head's gonna be 0.6. A student tossed this coin ball nine times. Okay, tossed it nine times. Believe me, it's not gonna be that hard. It's not gonna be that hard. You, you guys probably are trying to recall that. Oh, like, what's that shit? Like in Algebra 2, we learned the probability. Like, oh, like if it's like. Not happening at the same time. Like if it's an and, you multiple. No, it's not gonna be none of that shit. Like, it's not gonna be that. It landed tails upside of five times and head side of four times. Okay. What is the probability that the coin will land head side up on the tenth toss? Just tell me. Whatever the f happened before, should that matter this time? No! You're flipping coin every single time, and every single individual time is completely independent of whatever happened, whatever the hell happened before, right? This is what you guys learned in algebra too, the whole like dependent probability, independent right like you don't need to remember those concepts just think about it logically i mean what kinds of events would be dependent something like this imagine i don't know we come back from a football practice and then there's a refresh and then there's that i don't know six uh yellow gatorade and two blue gatorade and fucking one red gatorade and like i really want the fucking red one right now and then you go into the refrigerator and you just grab random one and it turns out to be fucking red. Does that affect my probability? Absolutely. You took away the only red. I got no red to pick from. So obviously my probability is dependent on whatever you did, right? So that kind of an event would be an, a dependent event, right? But you really shouldn't have to memorize any of these. If you just logically think about it, whatever the f that happened before, would that affect my probability right now? That's all you need to think about. And if you're flipping a coin, whatever the f happened before, now I'm flipping a coin again. This is a new f you know, case. So if whatever the hell it comes out to be, the probability will be completely independent of whatever the hell happened before. So on the 10th toss, what's going to be the probability it's going to end land on the hits? What's the 0. 0.6? That's just going to be it. Whatever happened before is not going to affect what's going to happen now, right? Just think about that. And 
Once again, you should not have to recall whatever the hell you learned in Algebra 2. It's just logic. It's just pure logic. All right, number seven. So, two histograms, blah, blah, cool story, bruh. Which of the following statements about the means of data set and data B? I mean, broskies and sisters, man. Man, look at all these bars, dude. All that part is literally identical. The only difference between A and B it is that A's got that little 60 to 70. It's got the higher value. So what the f*** do you think is going to be happening to the means? Obviously, the mean of the data set is going to be higher. The answer choice B, the mean of the data set A is greater because it's got that big dude, right? It's got the 60 to 70 that the data set B doesn't have. Obviously, the mean is going to be higher. How do you get me? You add them all up and divide by numbers of shit. You have a bigger dude. You won't be adding more, so you're going to have a higher number. Boom, Shaka, that's it. All right. Number eight and nine's got to do with this. All right. So, hey, me drove a car. Yeah, cool story, bro. So, there's a D distance, and then D is equal to 60T. Cool story. So, she's probably going at uh, 60 miles per hour or whatever. All right. So, according to the model, what distance in miles had Hamey driven Three hours after she's driving, D is equal to 60. T, the time is three hours, 180. Boom, what the f***? Nine, what interval represents all values of T during which Amy drove in North Dakota? North Dakota is right there and right there. And if you think about it, whoo, this is where you want to be careful. Right there is after two, 120 miles. Given that she's going 60 miles per hour that we figured out from this now, well, that should be a two-hour tick mark, right? So that's at the two-hour tick mark. And you know what people do? They're like... Oh, that's 360, so that should be uh, T is equal to 6, right? Oh, f***ing hell no, nah, dude. Hell no. Nah. This is not 360 miles, bro. This is 120 and 360 together, total of 480 miles, right? So that's total of 480 mile mark, a.k.a. divided by 60. That should be T is equal to 8, right? It's not 6. So if you fell for it, yeah, I mean, don't make that mistake. Well, be glad that it wasn't one of the answer choices, right? They don't have the two and six like this, right? Because I'm pretty sure had that been there, there would be so many people, the so-called smarty pants would probably circle that f***ing wrong ass, uh, answer choice, right? It's like, oh, like six, that wasn't hard. No, it should be eight because it's 120 and 360 all combined up until the end of North Dakota trip, right? All right, number 10, the graph, blah, 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 D days, blah, 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 blah. Between which two days was the growth rate, blah, 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 the greatest? Where was the growth rate the greatest, a.k.a. where did it grow the most in that time, given time interval, a.k.a. where was the slope the biggest, right? Because what are we talking about? Growth rate, that's literally increase. What tells you the increase? The slope tells you the increase. Take a look. It is definitely that guy right there, the steepest slope you can see in all those different lines. And that is between five and six days. Answer choice B. Easy. All right, moving on. Number 11. A local restaurant gives a teacher's 20% discount on, on all their meals. If the teacher pays $14, so whatever the original price was, I'm going to call it OP for the original price. And then 20% discount means they are not responsible to pay that 20%, aka they are only responsible to pay 80%, right? Take away the 20 from the 100, so times 0.8, and then apparently they pay $14 after the discount, right? So what was the original price? You just simply go ahead and divide by 0.8 on both sides. And yeah, this one, I would definitely use my calculator because I don't want to take my chances. Like 16.8, 17.5, that seems pretty goddamn close. I wouldn't take my chances. So the original price of when you divide 14 by 0.8 then you get 17.5 answer choice b i would not play my uh risk on uh the choices a and b like they're way too close i would probably not use my mental math on this number 12 the frequency table above blah 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 don't read any of that jack shit, but we do want to pay attention to 80 bottles of water at a bottling plant cool story bro the bottles are only sold if they contain at least 19.8 stop it so 19.8 and beyond that's cool but no more than 20.2, stop it. So 20.2, uh, 20 so up until this is what's cool, right? 
uh, fluid ounces of water, okay? So if the proportion of bottles that can be sold is the same for the sample, of, sample and the 16,000 20 ounce bottles produced at the plant each day, how many of the 16,000 bottles cannot be sold? So let's look at the proportion right now, right? So we know this adds up to a total of 80 bottles right now. And out of the 80, the ones that cannot be sold are the ones that don't fit into the 19.8 to 20.2 range, which is going to be this one, this one, this one, and this one, the 19.6, 19.7, and then 20.3, 20.4. How many is that in total? One, zero, one, zero. So add them all, that's a two. So out of the entire bottle, 80 bottles, two cannot be sold, right? So then if you have 16,000 bottles as they have it right here, if you have 16,000 bottles, then how many would not be able to be sold? Well, proportions, right? You guys can just literally set them into fractions and set them equal cross multiply, call that X, right? So you can go ahead and, you know, cross multiply, do all that shit. Or you can use the Stephen King method and be like, oh, dude, 80 to 16,000, that's just times 200. Well, Stephen, how'd you do that fast? 8 times 2 gives you that little 16. I got 1, 2, 3, 0. So 1, 2, 3, 0 is right there. So you should do the same thing over here, times 200, and that's going to be 400. Answer choice C. Once again, if you didn't... If you don't like the way that I do things because you feel like you might make some stupid mistakes by doing so, you can just cross multiply and that'll be 80 times X is equal to 16,000 times 2. Please don't multiply it until you really, really have to. I know we're on section 4. You're allowed to use calculator what whatnots, but please, please do not, um, uh, you know, get into a habit of, you know, multiplying any until you realize you really, really have to. So divide by 80s on both sides. And when you do that, you can actually cancel one of the zeros like this. And you can cancel the eights with this 16. So that'll be a two. So that's basically 200 times two, which is 400, basically what I got up there. So answer choice, C it is. So same thing, but hey, I mean, for problems like this, I highly, highly recommend just setting up that little proportion, what we do all the time. However many bottles, however many can't be sold. Then, however many f***ing bottles and however many can be sold, just make them into proportions, set them as fractions, set them equal to each other, cross and multiply the same drills all the time. Number 13, for the linear function f, the table, whatever, blah, blah, blah. What is the y-intercept? You heard it, y-intercept, x is zero. I got that little table right now. Mm -mm, yeah, I don't have the equation, so I should probably come up with the equation. Well, it says the linear function, so let's figure out the slope. I'll just use the bottom two. That'll be like, uh, that'll be minus six, and that'll be plus two. So slope will be rise negative six over positive two run, and that'll be negative three. So that's the slope right now. So you can do the typical linear equation sort of a thing to figure it out. So y is equal to mx plus b. So I'm just going to grab negative 2 and 8. That sounds pretty cool because they're both even and all. So that'll be 8 is equal to uh, slope, which is negative 3. X is negative 2 and plus b. So 8 is equal to 6 plus b. So go ahead and subtract 6 on both sides and b is equal to 2. So that should be answer choice C. Now. How would I have done it? I probably wouldn't use that equation, at least for my first attempt. I'll definitely use that for my second attempt. So now that I know the slope is negative 3, I'll just be like, yo, from negative 2 to 0, that's a plus 2. So from 8 to whatever, that should be minus 3. And then another minus 3, so a total of minus 6 from the 8, and that should be a 2. 8 minus 6, that should be a 2. That's how I figured it out without having to run through the freaking linear <laughs> equation. Like I said, I'm probably going to play both, but for the sake of you, well, you should probably, uh, you know, stick with whatever you're comfortable for your first attempt and then come back to try the other method if you have some time left. All right, moving on. Number 14. When a buffet restaurant charges $12 per meal, the number of meals it sells is 400. Okay, cool story. $1,200, $1, 400 meals. For each 0.5 increase in the price of the meal, stop. So what are we doing to the 12? We are adding 0.5, another 0.5, another 0.5, on and on and on and on. So that'll be 12 plus 0.5x, I'll call it. And then I have the number of meals sold per day decreased by 10, 10, which means 400 minus 10, minus 10, minus 10, on and on and on and on. So that'll be 400 minus 10x is going to be another one, right? So, what is the price per meal that the results that results in the greatest sales, which is why I'm multiplying these two, because how do you figure out the sales? How much you're selling for each and how many you're selling, you multiply the two, right? 
So basically, we want the greatest sales, aka people. If you look at it, if you foil that shit out, that will be a parabola. Does everybody see that? It's going to be a quadratic. So there's so many goddamn different ways of doing it. Let me give you some ideas. Number one, you can just punch it into this guy. Just literally punch this thing as is. Like, don't even foil it. Just punch it in as is, as you see it. And let the calculator give you this nice little parabola. Just make sure to play around with the windows because... The standard window may not show the entire graph for it. So just figure out the freaking vertex and figure out the maximum in your calculator, right? Everybody knows how to do that, right? You just press a second trace and then you calculate in the, the maximum, right? You can do that. That's the easiest way. But just remember, these are the prices. So you want to figure out what the X is equal to and then put that back in here to figure out the, what the price is going to be. So whatever you get is not the answer. Well, you're, I think you're going to get X is equal to 8, I think. And if you get X is equal to 8, you just plug it back in here and then figure out the price. That is one way, right? Another way, well, now I'm going to do it in hands because I'm an old school guy. So what I would have done is this. Well, people, check this out. You know these two are going to give you the zeros, right? They are the x-intercepts technically. So I kind of solved for it. So I was like 400 is equal to 10x. So x is equal to 40 I got on this one. And then over here, 12 is equal to negative 0.5x. So x is equal to negative 24 on this one. So these are my two zeros. You know this is a parabola. So if you know that the zeros are sitting at negative 24 and 40 like this, and it's going to go something like this, where the f*** this is, it's going to be right down in the middle of the two zeros, right? Because the parabola is perfectly similar. Symmetrical. So what I did is I just took the average or the midpoint, which is going to be 16 over 2, which is 8, right? So I knew that X is 8 right there. So what did I do? Knowing that X is 8, I just plugged that shit in right there. And then I got 12 plus 4, which is $16. That's how I got my answer. That's another way of looking at it. Now, I'm not going to do it, but y'all could have also done. Y'all could have also done. Uh... If you have this the, this function right now, you can foil that shit and put it in that ax squared plus bx plus c form and use the whole x is equal to negative b over 2a thing to figure out the x corner of the vertex and then put that x back in there. You could have also done that too. I don't know if I have mentioned it throughout the course, but another thing that I highly recommend is for everybody to go on YouTube after this class is over, go on YouTube and search up. TI whatever model that your calculator is, TI whatever quadratic formula program on YouTube and you're going to find some geeky ass nerd come out and teach you how to develop that program on your calculator. The dumbass part about this college board SAT is they do not make you reset your graphing calculator on the day of the test. So you can have whatever the f the programs you want to have on your calculator and they're not going to make you reset it. You can have all of that. So if you have that and you put it in this AX, AX, plus, AX squared plus BX plus C, the standard form, then you can literally just punch in A, whatever this is, B and then C and the calculator will literally just give you x values so you know you can figure out the zero and then you can figure out in between to find the vertex whichever way there's so many different ways to do this problem but obviously i mean if you want to do the least amount of work possible yeah probably just simply just graph that function as long as you can come up with that function and plug it in right now is that the are those the only ways no if all of those fail, I mean, you really shouldn't fail on all of those because how many ways did I just tell you? Like what, like four different ways of doing it. But if you couldn't do any of those numbers, what do you do? Plug it in. Oh wait, how, Stephen? Well, this is how you can do it. It's not, bear with me. It's gonna be fucking inefficient, but let me show you how to how you would have done it. Imagine you wanted to say D is the right answer. Then you went from $12 to $28, right? So that is a total of uh, $16 increase. You knew that every $0.5 uh, increase in the meal, well, it's going to go down by 10 So the fact that you went up by $16 means you went up 32 times. So 32 times. So your number of meals went from 400 and then subtract 320, right? So that will be 80 meals. So you're selling $28 uh, per meal, and then you're selling a total of 80 meals. So what do you do? You just multiply those two, see what you get, whatever the revenue it is. You do the same over here. You do the same here, same here, same here. See which one's the biggest number, and A is going to give you the biggest number. It's the most inefficient way for this particular problem, but hey, by all means, it works. It's better than just like just sitting there, just panicking, not knowing what to do. You can still plug in. It's going to work. I'm just saying it's not the most efficient way, but it could have worked. 
All right, so a lot to say about the number 14. All right, number 15, scatter plot, blah, 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 blah. Here we go. What is the equation? Okay, y-intercept. That's like almost a four-ish. So, uh, well, I should start from the bottom. 1.3, that's no cool. C, 3.7, that's cool. And 1.3, nope. And 3.7, that's cool. So get rid of B and D. And then between A and C, the only difference is, is it a positive slope? Is it a negative slope? It's going up, so it's got to be positive slope. What the f*** is this? A? Hey, you should not have even freaking try anything else. That's it. All right, number 16. For linear function, so f of 2 is 10. Stop. So 2 and 10. And then graph has a slope of 3. So slope of 3, my f***ing get rid of this, right? It's got to have slope of 3. And then 2 and 10. Yeah, you can figure out the y and set by y is equal to mx plus b. And then freaking y is 10 and slope is 3. x is 2 plus b. 10 is equal to 6 plus b. Subtract 6 on both sides. b is equal to 4. So that would be answer to You could do that or Stephen can method, broskies. 2 and 10, just plug that shit in and see which one is going to be valid. If you look, d is going to give you 10 is equal to 6 plus 4, which is absolutely correct. But if you look at c, that gives you 10 is equal to 6 plus 10. Hell no, that's not it. So yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't use that equation, but whatever floats your boat. Here we go, number 17. If 7x plus 2 only 1 is equal to negative 2, what is the value of x plus... Oh, come on, stop solving for x. Oh my goodness. Just take out, take out the 7s and boom, boom, look at it. x plus 3 is negative 2 over 7. You're done, man. Please do not solve for x. I cannot tell you that enough, right? Do not solve for x. Number 18, the solution. What is the value of 3x plus y? Out of everything they could have possibly f***ing asked, they just want 3x plus y. Why? Because take a look, man. If you just add this sh 3x plus y is 15, man. Come on. Don't solve for x. Don't solve for y plus Don't do that systems of equations. As I always tell you, if the SAT asks for 3x plus y, you want to solve for 3x plus y. Will it work all the time? Not 100% of the times, but over 90% of the time, this is going to work. It's not a coincidence that you just happen to add them and it just happens to give you 3x plus y. It's not a coincidence. I cannot tell you that enough. All right, number 19. An advertising agency guarantees that its services will increase by 3.5%. So multiply by 1.035, multiply by another 1.035, and on and on and on. Shit, definitely not freaking linear. It's exponential, and it's increasing. So increasing. What the fuck? All right, number 20. The scatter plot, blah, 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 11 points. For how many data points is the... Here we go. Please pay attention to the wording. I hope ain't nobody tripping on questions like this anymore. The Y value predicted by the line of best fit greater than the actual. So predicted is bigger than the actual. So are we looking for points above the line or below the line? The f***ing below the line, right? Because the predicted is greater than the actual, meaning your line is standing at a place higher than your actual. So the line is above the point. So you technically want the points below the line. One, two, three, four, five, five point it is. Do not put B. My goodness. Just because you read the word greater doesn't mean you're looking for points above the line. This was actually below the line. Well, is that always the case? I feel like according to our statistics that we probably see more questions that it turns out that the line is above the points. Like I feel like we've seen more of those as the right answers, but please, please, please do not just generalize that shit and be like, oh, next time I see it, I'll just look for points below whenever they say greater. It's like the opposite. No, 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 no. They may reword it again and try to trip you off again. So just watch out for what the questions exactly say.
let's get it. Number 21, Dana's riding a 100 mile long uh, bicycle race, cool story, we're 100 mile long, and then the function is this shit. what are all these representing? So X is the number of hours, and then that models the number of miles remaining. Okay, so F of two is equal to 64, what does that mean? So X is two, so two hours and 64 miles remaining, right? Something like that. So let's start from the bottom. D, two hours after, she has 64 miles remaining. That's absolutely correct. That's literally verbatim what I just wrote down. But let me just double check the other ones to see they're all wrong. C, when Dana has written 64 miles, no, 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 64 miles is not the, the miles that she had written, right? It is the miles that it is remaining. So B, Dana will write this last 64 miles. Mm -mm. A, Dana rides about 64, Dana rides about 64 miles in the first, mm, mm, no, 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 64 is the miles remaining. All these are wrong, these gotta be the answer choice. All right, so number 22. Yo, peeps, th does everybody recall this? Did anyone see this question and they were like, wait, I swear, I feel like I've, this, I've seen this exactly the same question before. Did anybody recall this question? It's almost verbatim too, right? Check this out. Triangle A, B, C, and D, F, R, you know, 29 degrees and 54 degrees. So basically they have to be the same. You don't even need to calculate whatever. Which of the following statements is sufficient to prove that triangle A, B, C is congruent to the E, F? So right now all I can say is because they all have the same angles, I can say that they are similar for sure. I just don't know if they're fucking equal. I just don't know if they're completely congruent. So I don't know what's going to tell me, what's going to help me to say that they are indeed equal. Let's get it. Almost exactly the same question as what we saw last time, right? Let's get it deep. The measure of angle BAC is equal to ED. I already fucking knew that. Triangle adds up to 180. I can figure that out by 180 minus 29 and 54 of the ABC, triangle ABC, triangle DEF. They're going to come out to be the same thing. So that doesn't help me jack about anything. C, the length of BC is equal to EF. This BC is going to equal to EF. Absolutely. If they're the same, then now I know that all the sides are proportional because they are similar at the very least, which means if the BC to EF is one to one ratio, then AB to DE better be one to one ratio and AC to DF should also be one to one ratio. So that will tell me for sure that it is congruent in D. And if you guys remember what I told you, what I told you about the the whole like what kind of answer choice you should be picking for. We're trying we're trying to say something about the two triangles. I don't know if you guys can recall what I said last time, but you're trying to draw some conclusion about the two triangles. So shouldn't you know something about the two triangles? Not just one of the two triangles. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We're trying to say something about the two triangles. So we might want to know something about the two triangles related sides or angles or whatever, right? But in this case, the angles don't tell me shit. So let's let me prove the other ones wrong too. B. The measure of angle EDF is 90. So what? So 97. Yes. Yeah, so what? It'll be 97 year too. It don't help me nothing. A. The EF is 10. So what? What is this then? I don't know. It's I can't fucking say that they're congruent. Only when they are equal to BC and EF, or they could have called the AB is equal to DE or AC is equal to DF, whichever one. But freaking some pair of corresponding sides, they would have to be equal for me to say the triangles are indeed congruent, right? So answer choice, C is the correct one. Almost exactly the verbatim type of question as what we saw last time, just differently worded, right? All right, so number 23, how many solutions does that have? And then some of you smarter people are like, oh, so fucking easy, it's just absolute values. Oh, so normally two answers, exactly. No, f no, man. Absolute value, dog. Absolute value. What does absolute value do? It turns anything and everything into fucking positive. How the fuck do you get any negative? Zero, you can't do that. When you take an absolute value of something, I don't give a jack shit that X is, it's not gonna be possible, bro. You can't do that. You cannot get anything negative by taking an absolute value of something. It's just not possible, boom. Number 24, the solution to quadratic, what is the value of A plus B? This thing is actually factorable, and I knew that because the question is telling me to um, sum these two solutions, but when I sum it, apparently I get these fractions. So that's how I knew it should probably be factorable. 3x and x, and it's going to be um, plus 1 and minus 2 right here. So this is how it can be factored. So that will be x is equal to negative 1 and x is equal to 2 over 3. So when you sum these two, when you add these two, that's going to give you negative 1 third answer, choice B. Now, 
If you're not good with factorings, I'm sorry, but you're going to practice. You're going to have to practice, bro. Like, factoring is a big part of this game. I don't even have to tell you. You probably know this shit by now, so you should really, really practice factorings. Now, but for this particular question, because we're on section four, what do you do? Grab this shit and just punch it into your calculator, right? And then let the calculator give you the two zeros and then just add the two. That could work too. I mean, but you should know this. If this was a section three problem, I mean, I would think it's a very fair game. Like, you should know how to do it. All right, number 25. Figure shown. Point, yeah, 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 whatever, 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 whatever. Whatever, whatever, whatever. If the area of the shaded region is 36 pi minus 18. Yo, stop. Yo, peeps, think about it. Look at this shaded area. How f do you think you can calculate that shaded area? Probably you grab the whole circle's area and then you subtract the square's area. And wouldn't that give you this shit? So basically, if you notice, the circle's got to match the 36 pi, and in a circle, it's got pi's, and then that square's probably this 18, right? So what do we know? It's a square, so it's x by x, so that'll be x squared is equal to 18, square root both sides, x is equal to plus or minus square root of 18, which is 3 times 3 times 2, so take it out. So x is plus or minus 3 radical 2. We're talking about the size of a square, so it's got to be only positive. I get it. So it's going to be 3 rad 2, 3 rad 2, 3 rad 2, 3 rad 2. They want the perimeter at them all. 12 rad 2. It is. Boom. Easy stuff. All right. Moving on. Number 26. Which of the is equivalent to expression? Yo, don't be intimidated by the power of fourth. As I keep telling you, the SAT people are not going to expect to know how to f***ing, you know, take the factors of the fourth power. You know, y'all do that like P over Q sh from your pre-calc. Does everybody remember that sh like, You don't need to do that sh okay? It's just going to be X, X minus 4 minus 4. Had it been X squared minus 8X plus 16, but please notice that you have to the power of fourth over here and the square over here. So just put that two right there and you're f***ing done. So if you look at it, well, Roman number two, yeah, that's literally what I just got. But you can further factor that into x plus 2x minus 2, and over here, same thing, x plus 2x minus 2. So technically, that is x plus 2, two of them, and x minus 2, two of them, and so that still works too. So both of them. And in fact, people, if you notice, this one, if you foil this sh you're going to get this, vice versa. So like Roman number 1 and 2 are literally the same thing. So if it works for one, it's got to work for the other two. All right, so that was number 26. Number 27, each year the value of investment incre increases by 2.5%. Stop it. So whatever the hell it is, we multiply by 1.025, right? So what looks like that, shit, only answer choice B. Don't read the rest. You do not need to read this. Cross them all out, right? All right, so moving on. Number 28, how many solutions does the system of given equations have? Okay, so first of all, it's kind of hard to compare right now, so what I'm going to do is I will grab the top one and multiply by negative 12 because then I would make the same y's, and if you saw it, it's going to give you the same x's too. But even if you didn't see it, well, I only multiply by uh, 12, the negative 12, because I wanted to align the y's nicely. And when I did that, check out what happens. I literally get negative 60y plus 12, uh, 60x plus 12y is equal to negative 108. Oh, sh that's exactly identical equations, infinitely many solutions. Same exact equations, x and y could be whatever the hell it is. If it works for the second one, it's going to work for the first one, vice versa, right? If we're talking about it graphically, we're talking about two linear equations that have the same slope, same y and set, overlapping on top of each other. It could be whatever the hell it is. Any point that works on one equation will work on the other equation as well. Infinitely many solutions. All right, moving on, number 29. Woo, too long. Bridges have spaces between their sections to allow for expansion. Of what the, who the f cares? Who the f cares? Whatever, whatever, whatever. I don't really care. I don't really care. I don't really care. I don't know what it is. For certain bridges, the gap width is 2.875 inches at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's, let's mark that. Let's mark that. So 2.875 inches goes with 40 Fahrenheit, whatever the hell that means. And then 1.875 inches at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So 1.875 inches at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So, okay, this is what we got, right? So now, uh, which of the following defines a relationship? So first of all, I want you guys to notice. As we went from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, this shit went down. 
the whatever width, the gap width went down. So if anything, we should be looking at a negative slope, which means get rid of C and D. We should be looking at negative slope. And if y'all see it, it's basically a linear equation written in some weird ass format. And now, so what do we do? Well, first of all, if y'all notice that we started with the 2.875, that is the y-intercept, yeah, there's f***ing the answer to us A, right? Because what the f*** is this negative doing right here, right? Now, how could you have double checked it? Plug it in. Plug it in. How about this? I'll just go ahead and plug in the 2.875 and 40 and see which one's the right answer. Check this out. Put 40. Put 40. And then that'll be 2.875 and 2.875. Now, we know A is the right answer because if you look, that's just going to be a zero. So let's cancel the whole freaking term like this. And so that just equals 2.875, 2.875. But take a look at what the B is going to give you. That would be 2.875 is equal to negative 1 over 60 times 80 minus 2.875. Whatever the f*** this is, that's going to be a negative for sure, not 2.875. That's why B is wrong, so it's got to be A. You really don't have to like actually do all the work, right? If you just figured out that it should be decreasing, aka it should gotta have a negative slope, then get rid of C and D, and between A and B, just plug it in. All right, and then number 30, easy AF question. I thought this was a joke. Like I literally had to take a second look because I thought this was way, this was way too easy for a number 30. But anyway, the number of books in the library increased by 30%, multiplied by 1.3, whatever the hell this is. <laughs> I'm already smelling it's probably going to be C, but let me just double check. From 2002 to 2014, so 2002, if it's X, then 2014, it would be 1.3X. Now, I literally had to write this just because I was suspicious. Like, this easy? But anyway, there were X books in 2002, so that's what I said. And which expression represents the number of books in 2014? F***ing 1.3X. The hell is this? Yeah, I, I, I thought it was, I really had to take a second. Like, I was like, wait, what? No f***ing way. But yeah, I mean, if you guys remember what I used to tell you, you know, throughout the course, if you ever feel like some of these questions are way too easy to be true, well, you're on a good track. All right, number 31. In a survey, 240 television viewers, three-fifths indicated that they like comedy. Stop it. So out of the 240, let me just kind of mark it. Three-fifths, uh, I like comedies. Okay. And then some indicated they don't like it. Some just didn't respond. Okay, cool. If one of the 240 viewers selected a random, the probability is 1 over 15 that the viewer selected did not respond. Okay, so there's uh, dislike, and then there is IDGAF, or I don't give a f and that will be 1 over 15. Okay, so now what we know it is, is whatever this is, whatever this is, whatever this is, they got equal to 100%, right? So take a look. I'm going to have a common denominator, and instead of this 3 fifth, I'll call this 9 over 15. So 9 over 15, the like... And then the 1 over 15, IDGAF. And then the whatever, whatever over 15, they got to add to 1. So what do I know? Well, that will be 9 and 10, so that'll be 10. So it's got to be 5, 5 over 15. So 5 over 15 people dislike comedies, okay? So how many of the 240 viewers? That's basically a third. So multiply the 240 by the third, and that's how you get 80 people. 80 people don't like comedies. Why wouldn't you like comedies, man? Comedy is the f All right, so yeah, 80 people. So make sure to mark some shit as you go and please, please have tick marks. I cannot say that enough, tick marks. Whether you tick marks or not, it's gonna literally make 30 to 50 points difference on the day of the test. Mark my words, mark my words. If you don't get 800, the perfect score on the first attempt, that's only because you didn't do your tick marks. Number 32, what is the Y corner of the Y intercept? Oh, Y intercept, this is nine. Oh, f no, dude. No, come on. Stay humble. Plug in X is equal to zero. Y intercept, X is zero. X intercept, Y is zero. So Y is equal to three to the zero power, which is one. Three to the zero power is one. One plus nine, that's a 10, bruh. It's not nine. Don't get ahead of yourself, right? Don't go too fast. Slow it down. Number 33, triangles. They're already nicely taken out from me. Okay, that's cool. Similar. Yeah, it looked like it. Whatever. Okay, okay, whatever, whatever. What is the value of cosine f? So I want cosine f, which is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse. You know what? I'll have jack given for that small triangle, but who cares? That go that's going to be the same thing as going to the angle C and taking cosine. So that adjacent over that hypotenuse, 24 over 30, cancel by 6 is 4 over 5. Done, so. 
Next, number 34. The graph. <laughs> what was the capacity megawatts of the blah blah? Median. I want the middle guy. That's a total of nine countries. So it says nine countries. So it's going to be the fifth guy. That's the median, right? I always start counting from the very lowest. So how about this time I start counting from the very highest? It's still going to be the fifth one anyway, right? So. Four, there it is, there it is, 863. And that's gonna be the uh, fifth guy, AKA the median, 863, that's it. All right, moving on, number, and then by the way, if you count from the smallest, it's gonna give you the same thing because check this out, 204, 536, 575, 628, and that's gonna be it, still 863, doesn't really matter. So if you wanted to double check this median problem, I guess you can start counting from the highest first, and then start counting for the lowest the second time, and then see if you still get the same answer. That'll be very nice. And then uh, number 35, line L. Okay, corners 2C is on line L. So that would be something like right there. I don't know what that is. What is the value of C? Yeah, if you're running out of time, if you literally have three seconds and your prop is like mark your final answer, I don't know, just say a 2.5. I don't know, what is that? 2.4? I don't know, just mark some shit. That's 2. Point something. But how do you really do it? Easy stuff. Just linear equation. What is the slope? One, two, three, four. Rise is negative four. One, two, three, four, five. Run is five. So that's the slope. And then you know the y-intercept is at four. So you have the linear equation. Y is equal to negative four fifth x plus four. And you just want to plug that two and c into this equation. So y is c, negative four over five, x is two plus four. There you have it. So c is equal to negative eight over five plus four, which I'll call it 20 over five for having the, sam uh, having the common denominator. So c is equal to 12 over five, and there you have it. And that is actually 2.4. So I was pretty damn right on in my guess, right? If you're just guessing, yeah, just, I don't know, man, that looks, that does look like 2.4 or something. <laughs> Leave it up to whoever's up there, I guess, right? If you got three seconds left for this one. All right, so, and also remember, uh, always try to put it in fraction rather than decimals because a lot of the times people try to convert it into decimals and then they make some dumb mistakes in doing so. All right, numbers 36 and 37 got to do with this little table sh so I'm not going to read this. Based on the table, what is the typical minimum weight of an adult African elephant in the wild in pounds? So minimum African elephant. So minimum African elephant. We're talking about 2.5 tons, they say. But you want it in pounds, bro, which they give you the conversion rate. One ton is... 2,000 pounds and ton on the bottom so they would cancel like this and that would just be 5,000. 5,000 pounds. Easy. Number 37. Based on the table, the typical lifespan of an African elephant in the wild is P percent greater than the typical lifespan of an Asian elephant in the wild. Stop it. So, uh, lifespan. Lifespan is right there. African 70, Asian 60. Okay, so like Asian is 60 and African is 70. Now, you might go, wait, Stephen, but like the way they put it right here, it's African on the left and Asian on the right. So why did they, why did you fucking reverse the order? Because, check this out, we want to see how many percent greater it is. So it wouldn't make sense for me to go from 70 to 60 because that's a decrease, right? 60 to 70 is an increase, but 70 to 60 is a decrease, which is why I didn't write it the way they had it. I wrote it the other way around because I want to compare from 60 to 70, how many percent increase would that be? So that is why I wrote it this way, not the way they have it in the table. So what is the value of P? Remember, peeps, person increase, person decrease, person greater, person less. I only do one fucking trick. Does everybody remember by this point, right? You should already you should already know this by now. I cannot say this enough. Person increase, person decrease, person greater, person less. Just do this, okay? So this is your ending value. This is your starting value. I just want you to literally just do 70 divided by 60, aka your ending divided by your start. And I've been talking about what this means, right? You are comparing right now's value to the yesterday's value or one year value, one year ago value, whatever, right? You are compare right now value to the previous value and then see if your right now value is greater or less. If it is so, by how much? That is the idea. That's the purpose of dividing the end divided by the start, 
all right? And when you guys do that, you're going to get 1.16667, right? What does that mean? It means if your start is 100%, your ending is 160.7%. So between these two, it went up by 16.7%. So answer must be 16.7 because P is the percentage. So 16.7%, P should be 16.7. So remember, peeps, Anytime, every time they give you percent increase, percent decrease, percent greater, percent less on the SAT, this is the only trick you do. Only do this, and this is it. This is going to be the universal key to all those questions. Just remember that. And, I mean, you could do, yeah, you could do 70 minus 60, which is 10, and 10 divided by 60, the original value. That's two step. This is one step. You're done, right? All right, last one, number 38. The table shows the several values, X and Y. Okay, it's got to follow this formula, which is a linear equation. What does the value be? I thought this was a joke. I had to take a second look again. It's like, what? Okay, let's find the slope. That would be plus 45, and that would be plus 1. So slope is 45 over 1. So there you have it. That's the slope. Okay, so you can plug it in if you want. So I'll use this as a 2 and a 106. So Y is equal to MX plus B. Y is 106, slope is 45, X is 2 plus B, so 106 is equal to 90 plus B, subtract 90 on both sides, and there you have it, you get B is equal to 16, and there you go, or the Stephen Kim method, I was like, man, f*** that, I'm too lazy to f punch it into my calculator, or like, do that equation, sh I just go backwards, bro, I just be like, 1, and then 0, so that should be minus 45, and then another minus 45, because I'm going backwards this time, bro, so that would be a total of minus 90 I should do from the 106, and that's going to be 16 done, so. I mean, I, I don't know who you are, I don't know what kinds of methods you like, but for me, I mean, my name is Stephen Kim, I like to do the least amount of work possible to still accurately get the right answer, so that's probably what I would do, but once again, I would probably double check in my calculator just to make sure. And if you're one of those people who have like crazy f***ing OCDs with your questions and shit, what you could do, I am really not recommending this, so don't take my words for it and be like, just go out there and be like, oh, you know, like, there's a guy named Stephen Kim and online, and he's like, he, he's the one who told me to do this. No, no, I didn't f***ing tell you to do this, what I'm about to tell you now, right? But what you could do is you can run down linear regression. I t already told you guys how to do this, shit, right? You go to your L1, L2 table, plug in, well, put put in the 2, 3, 4, your X value into the L1 column, and then put in this 106, 156, the L2 column as a Y value, and then literally run down linear regression, and then let that give you the equation for you, and then you just go ahead and plug in. Actually, you don't even need to plug in. Like, that'll they'll literally just give you the Y intercept for you. You can do linear regressions if you would like. I mean, if you get used to it, you can probably do that in like 30 seconds of a time. So actually, yeah, I mean, why not, right? I mean, you shouldn't need it, but why not? I mean, if you're done with the whole section and you got so much time left, you just want to double, triple, quadruple, check it. Yeah, then let the calculator do the linear regression to see if it's going to give you the same answer. But regardless, I already talked about this. Please learn how to run down regressions, linear regression, quadratic regression, exponential regression. Just learn how to do it for the sake of the test because you may get a question that, once again, you do not need to know how to do it, but it'll be a good safety sort of an option that you can go back to uh, just to use it as to double check your answer or if you just completely black out, then you can just let the calculator do the work for you. I mean, this was linear, so not that bad, but had it been like quadratic or... I don't know, exponential, it could have been perhaps a little bit more difficult, right? So please, please learn how to do regression. If you don't know how to do it, and if you uh, didn't really catch when I uh, taught you how to do it using the L1L2 table, well, please go on YouTube and just punch in TI, whatever the model you have, and then how to do regressions, how to do linear regressions, how to do quadratic regressions. And some right. nerd's gonna come out and teach you how to do it in like three to five minutes. So basically, that wraps up the entire 2021 March SAT. How did you guys feel? Do you really feel like there's any difference between this test and any other test that you've worked on so far? I hope not, right? And I hope that the questions are sounding very repetitive from this point on. So once again, I mean, you guys are very good and you guys you know, can potentially all get something like perfect score, if not the perfect score. It's all about the desperateness once again. You just gotta stay desperate and not miss any single part of the question so you don't miss some dumbass questions. And please, please, if there are some of the concepts that are still need, that are still to be clear, please come to my office hours and go in and ask those questions away and I will explain until you get it, okay? And if I can't do my job for whatever reason is I highly doubt that's gonna happen, then I'll 
find somebody else on YouTube or something to teach you how to do it, like box whiskers and shit like that. So please, please clear your questions away and you guys all will be in good hands. So that's it for this entire 2021 March SAT class.